Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, Plains, Prairies, and Grasslands, Biomes of Australia, Part 3. Presented by NADHAB Expedition Leader, Nikki Sentinella. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you for joining us here today. Take it away, Nikki. Thank you, Rob. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope you are all doing well today. Uh, I'm continuing my Biomes of Australia series. So we've touched on some of our alpine environments. Um, and we also started with our different types of rainforests in Australia. Uh, but today I wanted to talk about grasslands. And grasslands are, they go by many, many names. Um, prairies is quite often referred to in North America. Plains, uh, savannas. Uh, so I wanted to touch a little bit, not so much on those words, but the definitions, how much the grasslands mean to the entire world, and what those modifications have meant for us, as well as a lot of other species here. Uh, the background here, these are a bunch of paper daisies or everlasting daisies, and this is in the hay plains in Australia. So this is in the Riverina area, sort of south east centre. Uh, absolutely beautiful when these all come out in the spring. So who am I? Hi, I'm Nikki. I am Australian. I am born and raised in Sydney, but I have done a fair bit of work around uh, pretty much most of the east coast of Australia and across the south. I am a NatHab expedition leader here in Australia and also in Canada. Uh, for those who've seen me on a few other webinars, I think this is the first one I've done in a while where I'm actually in Australia. So I just finished a Southern Australian tour and I'm here in Nipaluna, Hobart, which is in Tasmania, Luchawida. So really nice to be here uh, and talking about Australia. Um, I'm also a conservation biologist, so I do a fair bit of research when I'm not guiding. And I will be touching on one of my projects as well. It's actually my honours thesis from a few years ago because it was centred out in the grass plains. So I'll talk about some of those modifications from a first-hand perspective as well. Uh, so what are we talking about today? We're talking about grasslands in general. What are they? How do we define them? Uh, we're going to talk about grasslands for their import as kind of the base of a lot of the biomass that we see in terrestrial systems across the earth. Uh, our grass plains support a huge amount of biodiversity, even though it can just look like a flat field of not much going on. Uh, but they're really, really important for our ecosystem and also for us humans. So I'll talk a bit about that. And then I'll narrow in to Australia, I'll talk about some of the grasslands that we see in Australia and talk about the modifications that we see. So what has been changing naturally, but also what have we changed as humans to our grassland biome? And to put all of that in perspective, I'm gonna be talking about a little bird called a plains wanderer, which most people haven't heard of, uh, even in Australia. It is a very uh, little known species in the center of that river arena area. There's only about a thousand individuals estimated remaining. So they're critically endangered um, and they serve as a really important indicator for us on the health of grassland systems. And then at the end, like Rob mentioned, uh, we are open for questions. So if you have any questions, please send them through at any time during the webinar and we'll go through them at the end. So diving in, what are grasslands? Grasslands, we picture a field of grass. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, so we'll talk a bit about what is grass. And it's dominated by poaceae. That's the family that is grasses. Um, but we don't only just get grasses. It is a mixture of other plant species. So we may see some forbs, uh, like something like our dandelions. Uh, we would also see some of our rushes and sedges, so more of our wetland species but sometimes they'll come through in our grassland environments. But generally it's dominated by this one family of grasses. Temperature is often used to define biomes. We talked about it in the Alpine series. 
Uh, but the grasslands can vary between minus 20 degrees Celsius to 30 degrees Celsius, which is a, a huge range. Uh, so we're talking kind of like zero degrees in Fahrenheit up to like 85 by some definitions, but this can be stretched on either side. So temperature, again, not always a really clear indicator. It kind of gets rid of some of the extreme environments like tundra, but uh, otherwise not always the most indicative. Uh, and then we also have rainfall. It's actually raining in the back of this picture. That's why our little kangaroo looks a little wet there. Um, generally, the rainfall is less than our forests. Uh, certainly less than any of our tropical environments, um, but then borders down to our desert as well, especially in Australia, a lot of our grasslands, or if you picture savannas in Africa, we border forest and then we border desert. So the rainfall is quite variable as well. So we're going to stick with the grasses, grasses making grassland. Seems straightforward. Um, so this is one of our sulfur crested cockatoos in a grassland and eating some of those grass seeds. So the grasses do produce uh, like flowering heads with seeds on them. Uh, the stems of grasses are hollow and that differentiates them from other things like rushes. So rushes are the tall plants that we can see in this picture. Um, and they have like a fibrous mesh in the inside. They're kind of like spongy, they're not hollow. Um, but grasses as a family are hugely diverse. There's about 12,000 species of grasses around the world. Uh, we see them pretty much in every single continent and branching into a lot of the other biomes. But we're talking about dominant cover. The grasses are also really important for us humans as a direct food source. Uh, about 51% of our diet comes from grasses. So we start thinking of our grains, um, our bread, our wheat, all of that. Um, and then rice, which is a bit separate, that's about 20% of our direct human consumption. So grasses are really, really important. We use them also as like a building material. If you think about bamboo, if you think about thatching, uh, they are a very integral part of how we live our lives, but also supporting so much of our ecosystems around the world. And when we look at things that are really high in biomass, so like bio, like organic mass, like the physical amount of all of it, um, you guys may be familiar with your classic uh, food web, your biomass tree, uh, where we start off with our primary producers, so turning energy from the sun into something that animals can use and that's when we're talking about our grasses and our trees and plants uh, we need so much more of that as a biomass to support everything about it so this is really like the baseline of our terrestrial systems marine systems have their own sort of bottom which will be you know your phytoplankton and your algae and things like that uh, but on land we're talking really grasses are a huge part of that this little chart talks about crops but a lot of our crops are also grasses themselves. So when we look at a, a flat field in the middle of nowhere, or you go out to a savanna plain, uh, it's good to remind yourself that this is the basis for so much life on earth. And uh, without it, we really wouldn't be where we are today. So with all those different definitions of grasslands, depending on how you calculate it, you could be looking anywhere between 30% and 70% of all of the Earth's biome is considered some form of grassland, which is massive. It is pretty much the most dominant biome as, one, as a single, single biome. So they support not just us, but many of our terrestrial animals on Earth. Um, this here is out in the hay plains, and you can just see how flat it is. People come out here and sometimes think, oh, what am I looking at? But after I've spent about uh, three months walking through all of these grass plains, um, I have a huge respect for the diversity, but also the support that they give so many, so many creatures. Uh, we think about our savannas over in Africa. You can think about your prairies in North America as well, supporting bison, supporting for us, the red kangaroos, our largest uh, terrestrial mammal. 
uh, and really just getting most of their sustenance from grasses. So this is one representation. I went through quite a few. Um, it does vary again on definition, but this gives you a little bit of an idea of how abundant grasses are around the world. And these are just grass plants, so grasses will exist in all the other biomes as well. Um, but this is dominated by our grasses, and it is an impressive map, really. It's covering quite a lot of the world. When we look narrowing down into Australia, depending on how it's defined, sometimes it does just like a lot of the maps will represent just small areas where we have the classic plains, where you have that classic prairie. Uh, but we have a lot of our ecosystems in Australia that are primarily grasses. Um, so this map kind of shows the different kind of grasses that exist also with some trees and also with some shrubs. Uh, but you'll see it includes our entire centre, which is often our arid or semi-arid desert region. But here we do see quite a lot of dominant grasses. So even though there's a bunch of bare ground and sand, the vegetation that we mainly see is our grass cover. So then when you look at it in that way, we're now including a large majority of Australia. So uh, depending on how you define it, we will stick more to some of our classic grass plains um, just to help us narrow in on what that looks like. Uh, but I just thought this was a really interesting map that really covers majority of country here. This is what we typically pi picture when we picture Australian grasslands. Uh, this is a recent, very long shot, um, just from my last trip a week ago, uh, of some kangaroos in a beautiful grass field. But this is a modified grass field. There are some areas of native grasses here but we are also seeing some modifications with a lot of pastures. So in Australia, uh, along with a lot of other places in the world, we see a lot of pasture growth uh, for us. It's for sheep and cattle, as well as for cereal crops, which is a massive part of our industry, as well as our food supply across Australia. And so often when we see these fields, uh, we see those human impacts, but it's still part of that grassland picture that is so important for so many species. So these guys, our kangaroos, are some of our largest marsupials, uh, and they really just sustained on the grasses. And they're often seen sitting up like the two on the left. They actually have a gap in their teeth so that they can have a bunch of grass sticking out the sides of their mouth and continue to eat while keeping an eye out. So what do we see when this changes? Um, we kind of know this as a base, um, but for us, it's such an important and fertile area. This is where most civilizations have centered around throughout history, is somewhere where we can grow a bunch of cereal crops. This is our primary food source for so, so long. And so we see a lot of human modifications, but we're also seeing some natural modica modifications. Uh, this is a native crow in uh, the Riverina area, and I will get to this guy in a bit, a bit of a, a teaser for some of the modifications we've seen in grassland, but I also want to talk about some of the knock-on effects of that as well. Um, as we know from other systems, if we change one thing, it doesn't just stop there. We see a lot of flow-on effects from those disturbances. So the classic ones that we often hear about in Australia and we consider uh, are our fires and our droughts. Uh, these are some beautiful bottom grasses. This is at the edge of Cradle Mountain and we're coming into a subalpine environment here. So this is very much the end of the grasslands and coming across at the edges of the waterways. We see this in a lot of plains as well. So you picture a flat plain and a lot of dominant grasses and then a river comes through and it's covered in trees. We still consider that whole environment grassland, even though you have other species there. Um, so in Australia, we, and around the world, we do think about our fires being a big impact. Especially grass fires will cover a fair bit of distance when it's been quite dry and you have some tall grasses. Uh, the grasses here, the button grass, actually really loves 
It wants to burn. It helps to clear out any dead vegetation and allow for new growth. Uh, some grasses will be able to germinate a lot better because of those fires. So we do need fire as part of our landscape in Australia, uh, but not to the extent that we've been seeing. And we've been seeing that increase and exacerbate as we move through uh, a lot of our changes that I'll get to. And similarly with droughts, in Australia, we often have a boom bust cycle where we don't have seasons per se uh, that are as strong as they are in other parts of the world. We often have these multi year cycles where we'll go through periods of drought and then we'll go through periods of flooding. This is quite normal for Australia if we look at climate history uh, and we need these periods to shift, uh, especially floods, thinking of inundating, we think of the Nile the way that you flood all the banks and you bring all this sediment in uh, and that helps to rejuvenate the soil and allow for more healthy grasslands. Um, but our droughts are getting longer and more severe and our floods are getting more severe as well. So after a while, if we're not getting any rains, we're starting to lose diversity. Uh, some of the fires as well is a human modification. And so obviously you can think of accidental fires uh, but we also look at fires in Australia as a way of hunting. Um, so First Nation peoples of Australia can use fire uh, quite purposefully to uh, clear out areas to make sure that there is adequate grasses. So here in the button grass moorlands, uh, the wallabies and paddy melons that come to this area prefer the button grass over the hardy shrubs. And so by burning and encouraging that button grass to grow and spread, then we're going to see more wallabies and then we're going to see more kangaroos and food. And so by modifying that landscape, we get more yield as well for our food. Uh, so there is this back and forth. And we've taken that a lot further when we look at human modifications. We think of grazing is a big one. So this is a sheep property in Kangaroo Island. Uh, and we see huge sheep properties across Australia, um, as well as cattle. This is a massive, massive disturbance when we think of grasslands in Australia. It's a huge difference when we think of um, all of the crops around the world and all of the grazing areas around the world. Uh, but we've seen some extra exacerbated effects in Australia specifically. We never had hooved animals in Australia. We never had ungulates. Uh, we didn't have sheep or cows or camels or horses. Uh, we never had any deer or deer-like species. And so when uh, settlers first came over to Australia, uh, we saw a lot of uh, pioneering and taking over of land in the early 1800s. And with that, sheep were brought over, cattle were brought over. And the sheep are often left to go and graze ahead of uh, the people and so you would have a wave of stock moving ahead and then you would have your people following behind and so by the time people started looking at some of these environments they were already modified by the sheep they let ahead of them so in australia we have actually quite soft loamy soils and all of our native marsupials and our grass lovers will uh, have soft feet. By having hooves, you're now compacting that soil. You're pushing that down and you're minimizing the amount of water that can penetrate into that soil. So now we don't have as much water retention on our soil and that's gonna affect what grows there. The other big difference, and I alluded to it briefly before, but our kangaroos, they'll take a bit of that grass, it'll stick out of their mouth and they continue eating. They have small, sharp teeth at the front, they modified in sizes, and they rip the top of the grass off and they maintain the base of the plant. The base of the plant stays intact. And that means that it can regrow. What we see with our sheep and our cattle is they eat the plant all the way down to nothing. So now this plant can't regrow in the way that it's used to. We see this when we have to re-sow fields we have to grow additional stock for our animals, uh, sorry, feedstock for our animals um, and give them supplement hay and cereal crops. We're growing whole fields just to feed our uh, sheep and cattle in Australia when our kangaroos wouldn't have done that. 
you would have been able to maintain the grass cover. So it's a very different system when we introduce that to an Australian landscape. We also think about cereal cropping and we think about our pyramid again. We need to create so much of those crops in order to sustain us. 51% uh, of our food production, right? Uh, and so that takes up huge amounts of land. And I think me personally, the inconspicuous look of our grasslands means that they've been overlooked in some regards as well in terms of our conservation value. So if we look at our grasslands around the world, this is the poorest conserved biome in the world. Um, it doesn't get the same draw conservation value that something like our beautiful uh, tropical rainforest might receive or our delicate alpine environment. Uh, but as we're learning, right, this is such an important biome and we need to maintain our native grasslands as well. So uh, if we look at the Riverina area in New South Wales, that's the Hay Plains. This is the area you'll be seeing most of my pictures from here on out are from the Hay Plains. Um, only about 3% of the biome is on conserved land. So whether there's a couple of national parks and there's a couple of small reserves, uh, it really is mainly food bowl production and like this uh, sheep and uh, cereal cooking. This is out on the Hay Plains, and this is what it looks like when we've had a dry season and we've had stock on it that have overgrazed. And as you can see, it is completely denuded. So the soil is firm, uh, the plants have been eaten down to basically nothing. Uh, and so now we have this hot red soil um, that's also going to attract more heat and it's going to be really hard for anything to recover from this. So it needs a really, really good rain to hopefully start to sprout to help support other plants to come up next to it. So when we overgraze, the recovery is even longer. And so we have conversations with uh, landholders about resting your fields, making sure you rest your paddocks so that they can come back to a healthy level and not overgrazing in the first place. You just graze a little bit and move to another field. Um, it means that the recovery is going to be quicker and it's going to be uh, more supportive of native wildlife as well. So to put some of this in context, there's a lot of different ideas going around, especially um, in, in my area in the Hay Plains. So I wanted to bring this in with a specific case study to talk about human level impacts and how that cascades and impacts our natural environment. And so this is a plains wanderer. Uh, they're very cute. They're very dorky in my view, in the best way. I love a dorky bird. Um, they've got beautiful long yellow legs and a uh, bright yellow eye. This is actually the female. So the female have this beautiful kind of rough and this rufous color neck banding. Uh, and then more patterned than the males. They are a wader. So they're a wading species, but they're an inland wader. They actually don't see the water, they don't see the ocean, they also don't spend a lot of time around lakes and rivers. Uh, they, their primary habitat is the native grass plains in the Riverina area. They're critically endangered, as I mentioned, there's only about a thousand individuals left. They rely on their cryptic colouring, so you can see the scalloped feathers at the back, and that difference in pattern really helps them to blend in. It helps them to blend in so much so that uh, one of my co-researchers um, had one plains wanderer that they'd released from a uh, breeding program. So it had a GPS tag on it. They had about five researchers with a GPS location trying to look for this single bird. And it took them over an hour within a small radius that they knew it was in and they only saw it because of the purple tag of the GPS. So without that, it would have been really, really difficult to see. This photo was taken by uh, Dave Parker, who does a lot of amazing work with uh, the Saving Our Species program uh, in New South Wales, and he works primarily with the Plains Wanderer. And so he goes out spotlighting, and this is his photo from that, where we drive very slowly at five kilometers per hour, basically a walking pace and we drive around at night uh, the plains wanderers will be sleeping and when they hear the cars they 
stand up like this and just have a look at you. And that's the only way that we can really spot them is at night when they just stand up out of their bed. Otherwise, during the day, if you're walking around, they're going to be wandering. And they are wanderers. They can fly, but they don't. Uh, they're very vulnerable as they then come out into the uh, air. You can imagine this quite flat environment. You do have predators about. Native predators in this environment would be your raptors, um, your birds of prey. And so as soon as you come out of that grass layer, you're now very vulnerable. So our plains wanderers have adapted to really just be really camouflaged and not flying. So they're not going to alert anything to their presence. This is all well and good in a native environment, but now we've seen the influx of invasive predators. So we're looking at our cats and our foxes. And if you're a cat or a fox, it doesn't matter if you blend in really because you can smell much better. So they'll be able to be uh, detected much more easily. They are ground nesting birds. And this is what I focused on was looking at ground nesting birds in general, but modeled after the plains wanderer. Being ground nesting birds, uh, they, these guys don't make a lot of effort to make their nest. Uh, you can picture your classic plover, plover. Your plovers will make a ground nest as well, but the parents will stay around and defend it very loudly or try and lure you away. Um, the plains wanderer will do a hardly scratch in the ground and sort of nestle the eggs in and hope you can't see it. It does work pretty well. Uh, but now with a lot of modifications that we see in this very poorly conserved biome, we are seeing a lot of loss in our egg. And that's what I wanted to look at. This is a male, so you can see they don't have this beautiful colouring. And you can see the chicks here, very, very small, absolutely adorable, really nice to see some young as well in this environment. And you have a look at the background of this picture as well. You'll see there is bare ground. If the grass is too dense, it's very hard for these uh, plains wanderers to move through the vegetation. So the native grass plains here have a little bit of space still in between them. And they have a mix of our grasses and some of our falls, as well as those beautiful paper daisies you saw at the start. So this is a native nest. This is after a rain, so this is quite um, tall habitat uh, in this environment. But you can see just nestled in the center there is a plains wanderer nest. Uh, so it is lightly lined, but it's more sort of moved into the grasses. And if you take a single step back, it is very difficult to see this. And I know because I've tried. Uh, you turn around and you forget where this is quite quickly because everything looks quite similar. And it's using that large plain um, habitat to conserve their, their nests. They'll typically lay four eggs. And when I replicated this, I also used four eggs. This is another natural nest. Um, this is in that more typical loose environment, uh, but this is also on a private property where there have been sheep grazing. So we do see a fair bit of soil compaction here uh, and it is a little dry, but this spacing as well, we do see a lot of these grasses are native grasses as well, which is good to see. But you can see really just tucked into a small bit of vegetation. So this is primary habitat for our plains wanderer. This is what we're looking at. You can see how flat it is in the hay plains, but you can also see that space. We have some beautiful native uh, daisies growing, uh, as well as a huge variety of grasses that grow here. And having that species variation is very important for this environment versus a single. And so this is, this is a pretty good level of habitat. We're seeing quite a lot of things are alive, but it's still a little bit spaced out. Uh, and then this is after grazing and uh, sheep have moved through the property. We're seeing different grasses. Um, the dominant grasses are not native to the environment. And we're seeing a lot of it is really quite dead and bare. And so what I did is I went out to see what was happening to these nests. What are the impacts that we've had by grazing on these properties uh, that then make these species or any ground nesting species vulnerable to predation? So I made artificial nests and you can see one up close on the left. So I have two quail eggs and they're a food incentive to act like a regular nest. Um, and so these are commercially um, produced and available quail eggs. And then the other two are plasticine. 
The plasticine we collect after, so we're not leaving that in the environment, but the plasticine is important because it doesn't dry out like a clay. And we use that plasticine to recognize the bite impressions on that egg. So the thought is you come along to the quail egg, you get some food, you try the other one, it doesn't work, you go bleh, and you spit it out. And then we can see who's kidding them. And so we wanted to test what the difference was in terms of vulnerability to predation in more of a uh, natural, less grazed environment versus an overgrazed environment from, in this case, sheep, but also in cattle. And so I put about, I didn't put about, I put 300 nests out into uh, different properties. It was all private properties, all with various levels of grazing. And at each nest site, I took a vegetation study. So I did a full survey of what species were in there, what the grass height was, how dense that cover was, and compared that with the levels of grazing, um, and then who predated and how often it was predated, how many days. I checked these nests for uh, just under four weeks, which is the native incubation period for the plains wandered. So it was really just trying to replicate what it would be like to try and raise your eggs in here. And this is what I found. So you can see these are the plasticine eggs that we went back and found. Um, you would have seen the GPS in my previous photo down in the bottom because it's very hard to find these nests again. We started writing notes on like, near the jelly bean shaped patch of grass by the shrub facing northwest uh, to try and find it because even with the gps it was really 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 difficult to find a ground nest in this environment so it really speaks to the native birds that are depending on this environment so here we could see the variety of predators and by using these teeth and beak impressions i could figure out who did it so at the top, um, we have an example of our cat. So we do see our feral cats. Um, we'll see feral foxes. We also have magpie here up in the top uh, right, the bee. And then at the bottom, we have a couple from the ravens. And the ravens will sometimes just do one peck and be like, nope, no good, no food here. Or they get frustrated that you've duped them and they will rip the plasticine to shreds because they go, um, excuse me, what are you doing? Um, <laughs> ravens are notoriously uh, ever following researchers and trying to mess with it, which I respect because they like they like their novelty and they're very clever. Um, so the one labeled D was a frustrated crow. <laughs> so what did we find? We found that uh, we are seeing foxes and cats, but there was less predation of foxes and cats than we thought. These areas were managed for foxes, so there are fox baits that go out and get checked regularly. And so we may not have been seeing as many foxes in this area. Um, but what surprised us was the number of ravens that were taking the ground nests. They do eat eggs, we know this, um, but the rates were really, really high. And so those rates were really, really high where the areas were overgrazed. And so when we look at the height of vegetation, we saw that more vegetation meant better survival and less vegetation meant they were more likely to be predated upon. Makes sense, uh, but we could show that. But what we could also show is that it was mainly ravens in the shorter vegetation. Um, this is a natural process normally, but we're seeing rates that are way higher than we normally see. So by us modifying the landscape, by us bringing sheep and cattle and grazing down really, really low, we're making our species vulnerable to a natural predation event, but at an unprecedented level. And so to show that it was ravens, we did a controlled experiment after. We did a very like natural field experiment, and then we said, okay, is it grass height? Let's just check grass height. And so here we used a weed whacker, a whipper snipper, as we say in Australia, to bring down that grass level and then put a camera on it so we could see who took this nest. Um, and so this shows us that the only thing that's changed uh, is the grass height. And then we did the same setup with the camera on the fence line without cutting the grass. So we could see what it's like when it hasn't been cut. And sure enough, it's our ravens. Uh, they're going out and you can see that they're taking the eggs whole. This is a caching behavior. So they will just like foxes would um, for things of the right size, 
they'll take one egg, they'll stow it away, they'll come back, they'll take the other egg and stow it away because they don't know how long this will be available for. And we saw of all of the sites that we cut, all of them got predated. There wasn't a single nest that survived in short vegetation. So it really showed us how important it was to maintain that grass mite. What we're seeing with ravens is a knock-on impact of our modifications to grasslands. What we're seeing is uh, an increased abundance of our ravens and crows because we are providing food sources, um, even just like feed pens for our um, domesticated animals means that there's a reliable source of food around. We are seeing water source availability by our troughs. Um, there's always going to be water for them. We're seeing things like carrion availability. So if stock passes away or if we're looking at roadkill, it means that there's huge abundances of crows and raven. Um, and we're also seeing fences. Fences are acting as really important perches for these guys. They can sit on a fence and they can survey an area very easily and without using any energy flying over compared to our aerial witches. So just by sitting on a fence, they're more likely to detect our native ground nesting birds as well. So the modifications we've made have made this knock-on effect that have increased our raven abundance. We have more ravens than we used to, and that's putting more pressure on our native species. Um, so it's an interesting dilemma because these are all native animals in the native grassland, but the proportions have been all blown out because of our human modifications. And so um, this is something we need to bear in mind. We're not just looking at lost native grasses, our cereal cropping, we're also looking at how we've changed the surrounding environment. Uh, this is also, I lost 10 of my nests one day. This is cattle just walking along. These were dairy cattle on a gismet, so they were coming to uh, just feed on the grasses on this property and they walk the fence line. Uh, and so they just destroyed all of the ground nesting birds there. Um, this would happen with any species, but because our dairy cattle like to go along the fences, they, they know where the gates are, um, we did see a huge impact of that. Um, so we we know how important our grasslands are, and when there's so many species that we don't even think about. We can think of our quails, we can think of our plovers, we can think of our beautiful plains wanderers, but also supporting from this ground level up, we're looking at all of our larger species. And by shifting our focus on um, maintaining all of this for our use, we're losing a lot of those benefits for a lot of our native animals as well. Um, we'll see a difference in the number of kangaroos based on our um, grazing practices as well in Australia. Uh, and I'd love to do a presentation later talking about the dingo fence, because that's another one of my projects. Um, where we look at where we have dingoes and no dingoes and the amount of kangaroos and rabbits we have on one side versus the other and how that has affected our grass land is another huge case study um, that I will get into at a future time. Um, so when we look out, out on these grasslands, we need to consider what's natural, what's not natural, uh, but also maintaining what may look like nothing is a very, very important part of the landscape. Um, and if we can support it, we can see some beautiful things come through, like fields of paper daisies. Uh, we can support a lot of our native species, uh, which we depend on for diversity, for security, and obviously for the huge conservation value that they give us. So I hope that when you head out into your next grass blades, even your field or your meadow and your backyards, uh, have a look at how many species are dependent on it not just from our plants, but also all of our insects, the birds that come and feed, and then the larger animals that are depending on those species as well. This is a huge part of the world's biomes, uh, and it just supports so much life. Um, and I think it's something that we often overlook. So I hope that you look at things a little bit different and how things flow on, and don't take those beautiful parts uh, for granted when you go out. You just see so much life out there. It really is quite beautiful. So thank you, folks. Thanks for listening in. Um, I hope you enjoyed a little bit of a look at our grasslands in Australia. Um, yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Now, if there are any questions, feel free to submit your questions via the question field in your control panel. All right. 
Uh, so let's see if we have uh, any questions. Um, anybody have any questions they would like to share today? Anything at all doesn't have to be related uh, to Plains Wanderers as well, um, but grass plains in general. Pretty cool place. Well, it doesn't look like we have any questions. I think you've really covered everything. So uh, I'd like to hand it back to you for any closing comments that you may have for us today. Thanks, Rob. Uh, thank you all for listening in. Well, I appreciate you guys coming on a deeper dive of the biomes of Australia. And I hope you've been enjoying this series as we go through. Um, I hope that once again, you can have a look uh, in your own environments. Um, it's so nice to see different things around the world. Uh, but I really want to bring it back to your homes and, and the appreciation of home spaces where we live and, and what we can do for those spaces as well. Nikki, thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today. And I'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. Now, if you are interested in information on how you can travel with NatHap, please give us a call at the number on your screen or you can send us an email at info at nathap.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including our registration links on our website at nathap.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude today's webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.